Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Spies. I'm the senior pastor here at Christ Church, and I want to welcome all of you as we gather together on this glorious Pentecost Sunday. Today is the day that we come together to celebrate that time when the, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. Effectively, it's the, the, the birthday of the church. I could definitely say happy birthday because it is the day that the church is established and it is the day that the church is equipped with power from on high to go out into all the world carrying the, the gospel of Jesus Christ to the furthest parts of the world. So today we're going to be talking about Pentecost and we're going to be talking about what it means for us that we are a Pentecost people established in the power of of the Holy Spirit. Well, before we begin our worship this morning, just a couple announcements. I uh, want to remind you that tonight on Zoom, we're going to be gathering together in our connection groups and continuing our study on the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Tonight, we're studying the topic of, of, um, of gentleness and what that looks like in, uh, as a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So that is from 6 to 7 o'clock tonight on Zoom. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, we're continuing also on Zoom. Uh, from Tuesday, on Tuesday and Thursday at 8 a.m., we're going to be continuing our morning prayer. And I want to invite all of you to come out for that. It's, it's a great time to, to, to just hop on the computer and begin our day by putting ourselves in the presence of the Lord and giving our day over to the Lord. Well, friends, let us begin uh, our time of worship and our opening acclamation is going to be a little bit different because it's, it's Pentecost. But I encourage you to follow along. Let us begin our, our morning worshiping our Lord together and blessing his name. The Lord will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. You shall know that the Lord is in the midst of his people, that he is the Lord and there is none else. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Together let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's worship together.
The first reading is from Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And the suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes, and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. The word of the Lord. The second reading is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as He wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all of the members of the body through many are one body, so it is with Christ. For one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. The word of the Lord. My dear friends in Christ, the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed him his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness, it is withheld. The Gospel of our Lord. Well, friends, as we come to the preaching of God's word this morning, I invite you to pray with me. Father, we give you great thanks that you have poured out your spirit upon your church. Father, we give you great thanks that you have given us the power of your spirit to take your life-giving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ out to the ends of the earth. And so God, as we come to uh, this time of, of looking at your word, we, Father, we pray that you would, uh, in the power of your spirit, open our, uh, our minds and open our hearts and that your love would be poured into our hearts by your spirit ever more deeply this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, our world is a mess. Our world is a mess. And I know many of you are feeling really burdened and are feeling really 
overwhelmed and very confused by all that's going on in our society. And so I wanted to, to, to frame our time as we come to this, this text talking about Pentecost. I want to frame our time just speaking in to the moment that we're living into. Um, because, friends, if, if you've turned on the news at all this weekend, then all you're doing is you're, you're hearing and you're seeing nothing but one conflict after another. Our society is deeply divided. We're divided along racial lines, along economic lines. There's deep social and political divisions. Uh, uh, because of COVID-19, everybody's got an opinion on how to respond, and that's causing us to divide. This week, we were all horrified as we watched the murder of George Floyd be, being plastered all over the internet. It was a, a horrific act. And even that has divided us. There are those that say that it was just an individual act. And then there, there are others who are, are saying, no, it's, it's part of a much deeper systemic injustice, and it divides us even further. You know, we're, we're looking for some type of leadership. And we're looking to Washington, and all of our leaders in Washington, they're, they're not helping anything. All they're doing is is uh, contributing more to the divisions because they're blaming each other instead of trying to bring us uh, unity. Friends, all we're seeing in, in our world today is just one power struggle after another. And it can be overwhelming and it can be disheartening. It really can. You know, I look at the world and I ask, how long, O Lord? I think that's the right prayer for us to ask. How long, O Lord? It's the right prayer for us to ask as long as we don't ask it from a place of despair, but we ask it from a place of confidence, knowing that Jesus is on the throne and knowing that he has promised that he is going to return and set all things to right. And so we, we pray and we lament and we ask, how long, O Lord? You know, I, I look at our world today and I also ask a second question. And the question is this. How does the gospel of Jesus Christ speak to our time, speak to the things that, that, that we're seeing and speak to the things that we are experiencing in our world today? How does the gospel of Jesus Christ bring hope to a hopeless world? Friends, I think that is the right question to ask. How does the gospel speak to today? Friends, we need to remember something. We need to remember that there is nothing new under the sun. The same story that's playing itself out on the world stage today is the same story that's been playing itself out throughout all generations that go all the way back to Adam. It's the, it's the same play, just different actors. See, that's because the, the same sinful nature that lies at the heart of every single human being just rears its ugly head in every generation. See, it's no coincidence that just one generation after the fall and after the garden, you have the story of Cain and Abel. You have the story of one brother killing another brother out of pure hatred and sheer jealousy. You know, you want to talk about injustice. Abel didn't do anything. Abel was innocent. All he did was everything that God had asked him to do and Cain killed him for it because he simply was jealous and he simply was murdered for it. That's why uh, Scripture says that Abel's blood cries out from the ground, calling out for God's justice. Same story, just different actors. Friends, do you know that when the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, that it was poured out into a time that was very similar to ours? Do you realize that? See, at Pentecost, there were deep social and political and economic and racial divisions. Now, the Roman Empire had come in and conquered almost the entire known world. And the Roman Empire, um, it, it proclaimed something that was called the Pax Romana, the, the peace of Rome, saying it had brought peace to the world. But friends, that was a misnomer because it was a false peace. It was a piece that was based solely on violence. The, the, the way that, that Rome was able to keep peace was simply because it had the largest army. 
That's how it kept peace. And look, if you got out of line, well, you know what they did? They came in and they just wiped you off the face of the earth. See, that's what happened to Jerusalem in 70 AD. They, there was a, a small uprising and, well, they came in and said, we're not having any of it and wiped them off the face of the earth. Jesus is our Prince of Peace. Jesus is our Prince of Peace because Jesus is the King of the Kingdom of Peace. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, um, Paul says, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 19, Paul says this, For in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated, and you who were once hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless. How does the gospel bring hope for the world today? It does so because Jesus Christ took on himself the sins of the entire world, those sins that bring hatred and those sins that bring division between us and and God and brings division between all humanity. He took them, he nailed them to the cross, he shed his blood for their forgiveness, and then he took them to the grave, and he left them there, and he rose again, bringing new life and bringing us a hope of a new way of life. And then he sends his spirit. He sends his spirit on those who were once enslaved to their sins, and he sends us out to proclaim that Jesus is Lord and sends us out to proclaim that others might be released from their sins as well. He sends us out to say that Jesus is Lord and all who call on the name of the Lord might be saved, might be saved out of the, the kingdom of darkness and brought into Christ's kingdom of marvelous light. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17, Paul says this, he says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, new has come. All this is from God, who who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, he says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. And so we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Friend, do you hear what Paul's saying? Paul is saying that we as a church, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And we have been given the message of reconciliation. As a church, we have become ambassadors of Christ's kingdom, bringing hope to a lost and dying and divisive world. Now friends, this is not just social reformation that I'm talking about here. See, at the foundational level, this is heart transformation that's going on. Social reformation is a good and necessary thing. But you see, social reformation without heart transformation is just another power struggle. That's all it is. It's just uh, another sinful, unregenerate people trying to be in control. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about heart transformation that leads to social reformation. See, if all we're trying to do is just to be in control, friends, that's just the that's just the Pax Romana all over again. That's just the um, that's just peace by way of violence. That's the that's the peace of Rome, and that's the peace that that all the nations of the world only have to offer. It's peace by way of violence, friends. I don't want the peace of Rome in my society, in in, in our hearts and in our church. I don't want the peace of Rome. I want the peace of Christ. I want the peace that passes all understanding. I want the peace 
of the gospel that comes and, and changes my heart, that forgives me of my sins, that, uh, and allows me to love my neighbor the way that God loves my neighbor. Friends, I want the peace of the gospel that takes a murderer like Saul of Tarsus and transforms him into a missionary and goes throughout all the world proclaiming the gospel of reconciliation. Friends, I, wanna, I want the gospel of peace that takes a slave trader like John Newton and transforms him into a catalyst for abolition and into someone who can actually truly sing the words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Friends, that's a hope that speaks to our times. Friends, please don't ever think that the gospel is otherworldly and that doesn't really say much to to our world here and now. Please don't ever think that it's otherworldly. There's a great book out right now. Um, It's called Dominion. And it's, you can get it at Barnes & Noble. It's written by an atheistic historian named Tom Holland. And what he does is he argues very persuasively in the thousand pages of that book that the world has been forever changed because of Christianity. He talks about how Christianity brought human rights and brought equality. That he talks about how Christianity brought dignity to women how it brought dignity and rights to children, both born and unborn, how it created hospitals and universities and brought education and medicine to those who could not afford it. Those things did not exist apart from Judeo-Christianity. Friends, don't tell me that the gospel is otherworldly. Friends, also don't think that the gospel isn't political. Don't think that the gospel isn't political. Friends, The message that Jesus Christ is king, who sits on the throne of heaven, who brings the kingdom of heaven to bear upon earth, that is a deeply political message. Now it completely transforms politics. It's not just one political agenda among others. It transcends and redirects our understanding of what politics is. But the fact that Christ is king and the fact that we pray for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, that's a deeply political message. And friends, in this political message that Jesus sits on the throne is our only hope for our world because it tells us that because Jesus reigns, that all the things that we're experiencing in our world today will not have the final word. Because Jesus sits on the throne And because Jesus is faithful, we know that there will be a day when he brings his kingdom fully and he'll set all things to right. Pentecost. Pentecost, the day that we're celebrating us today, reminds us that we carry that kingdom message with us everywhere we go. And that's what I want to look at today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at Acts chapter 2. We're going to look specifically just at Acts, um, at, at the first four verses is all we're going to really look at today. But I think what we're going to see is that, is that when the Holy Spirit is poured out, that Christ equips his church to be his kingdom messengers and to bring the kingdom of hope into a world that is hopeless. And he does it by giving us three things. He equips us with his his power, he equips us with his presence, and he equips us with the proclamation of the kingdom. Those are the three things that we're going to look at. And so as you're turning to Acts chapter 2, if you remember, last week we talked about the ascension, the ascension of Jesus. Uh, We said that the ascension is what makes Pentecost possible, that Pentecost is actually the earthly side of the heavenly arrival of Jesus to the throne of God. See, when Jesus ascends to the throne, he sits down at the right hand of the Father and he sends his spirit. In fact, that's actually what Peter says in his Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 33. He simply says this. He looks at the crowd and he says, 
This Jesus who was raised from the dead, being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has, he has poured this out that you yourselves are now seeing and hearing. He looks at the crowd and he says, friends, you are witnesses to the confirmation that Jesus is now king, that Jesus sits on the throne. And just like a new king, whenever a new king would take a throne, he would send out witnesses to go out through all the world and to tell the world that a new king has been crowned. See, and that's what Pentecost is. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, it says that they were all together in one place. Now let me get a little context here. Um, here's this day of Pentecost. Pentecost was a really important Jewish festival. Um, it was called the 50th day. That's kind of how you translate Pentecost. Um, in the Old Testament, it's also called the, the, the Feast of Weeks. This was a harvest festival. This was when uh, the harvest was about to be um, harvested and the farmers would go out into the crops and they would bring in the first fruits of the harvest. They would bring in sheaves of wheat and they would come and they would sacrifice it to the Lord. They would offer it to the Lord as a way of, as a way of um, showing their gratitude for God to cause the growth and also praying for God to, um, to, to fully bring in the full harvest, to, to continue growing the, the, the crop and for safety for the harvesters. And so Pentecost is a harvest festival. But Pentecost also had another significance. You see, at the Exodus, when, uh, when uh, Moses leads Israel out into the wilderness, it says that 50 days after the Passover, they come to Sinai. And it's on that 50th day that God gives the law to Moses. And so Pentecost, they're celebrating the, the, the ingathering of the harvest and also the giving of the law. And that law was the central um, uh, point of identity for Israel. And it showed them how God had expected them to live. But if you remember, in the pro there's a promise of a new covenant. There's a promise of a new covenant. In Ezekiel chapter 36, starting in verse 26, God, through the prophet Ezekiel, tells Israel, he says, in the, in the new covenant, I will give you a new heart, and I will put my spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to obey my laws. In Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 31, God says the same thing. He says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. In those days, I will put my law within them and I will write my law on their hearts. See, friends, it's no coincidence that God chose the day of Pentecost, this day of of commemorating the giving of the law to pour out his spirit and write the law on the hearts of his people. See, it's no coincidence that in the power of that same spirit that the disciples who were in that room would then become the first fruits of a much greater harvest, a harvest that's greater than anything that the world has ever seen. Do you see how all of these are fitting together? Do you see how God just weaves this beautiful tapestry together throughout all Scripture? God does not do anything haphazardly. He's bringing about his salvation by the grand design. Back to Scriptures. So here you have all the, the disciples gathered in a room. It's probably the 120 uh, disciples that we see back in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. And then in chapter 2, of, of verse 2 of chapter 2, it says this. It says, They were all together, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And this, see, friends, uh, friends, this is what you've got. You've got them all sitting there, and all of a sudden, this surprising thing happens. 
this sound like a mighty rushing wind comes in and fills the place. Earlier this week, I had a really um, uh, just fun moment where I think it was Wednesday morning. I was sitting, uh, I was sitting on my back patio or my, in my sunroom, and I was studying for the sermon, and it was the same time that that big tropical storm was coming through. And I was sitting there watching as all the wind was just kind of whipping around and, just, and, and reading this, and I was just thinking, oh man, how cool is this? You know, we've, we've all experienced those kind of really loud winds. We've all experienced uh, hurricanes. Some of us have experienced tornadoes. And, and we all know just how powerful wind can be. And when a wind comes in, it can be really loud and it can be dis, disorienting. That's what's happening in this room. You've got this powerful wind. See, what God is doing is he's actually pouring out his power on his disciples. Remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and all Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, Jesus equips his church with power. Now, this isn't just the type of power that creates one more power struggle. Now, this is, this is a much different power. This is, uh, this, is God, this is God's transforming power. It's a power that creates. It's a power that accomplishes his will. Is it more powerful than anything on earth? Absolutely. But, it is, but it's more powerful because it's a transformative, creative power. See, God's power, when the Holy Spirit comes in, it's certainly a power to tear down strongholds, both in the world and even in our lives. But see, when God tears down strongholds, he does so that new life might be brought in, where the, he, that, that the places where the kingdom is not yet present might come in and the, and the reality of the kingdom might be made known and new life is brought in. That's the type of power that he equips his church with, with the Holy Spirit. And he does so that we can go out and so that we can bring his kingdom message to the place where death and darkness reigns. Because we have the power of the Holy Spirit, you know what that means for us, friends? That means that our mission can't be stopped. It means that our mission can't fail. It means that we have words of hope and life that, that the, the lost and dying world needs. And as we speak that kingdom uh, a message, God's God's word does not return void. He gives us that power and sends us out on a mission with that power. Acts chapter 1 verse 3. Acts chapter 2 verse 3. The power of the wind comes in and it says that uh, divided tongues as of fire appear to them and rested on each one of them. Not only does God give his church power to proclaim the message but he also gives us his presence. And friends, it's a purifying presence. See, fire in Scripture is a symbol of God's presence. If you remember in, in Exodus chapter 3, Moses sees a burning bush. And it's from out of the fire of that burning bush that God reveals himself, that God gives Moses his name, the I am that I am. In the wilderness, as Moses leads Israel through the wilderness, it is God's pillar of fire that leads the whole company, showing that God is with them. When a sacrifice was made, the fire that, that consumed the sacrifice was God's presence, and it showed that God was accepting whatever sacrifice was being offered. See, at Pentecost, the fire comes and the fire rests on them. This presence of God rests on them. And that means that, the, that it actually never leaves them. See, from now on, what, it's, what we're seeing at Pentecost is that God's presence will be with his disciples. And in fact, this is actually temple language. Think about that. This is temple language. Paul says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, both individually and corporately. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and like at the tabernacle and the temple, God's glory fills the church with the Holy Spirit, and it's a presence 
that never leaves, and the church then becomes the place and the people through whom God's presence is known to the world. But fire is not just a symbol of God's presence. Fire is also something that purifies. It's a, it's a purifying fire. Now, what at Pentecost do you think is it that gets purified? Now, of course, we can say, of course, it's the, the hearts and the lives of his disciples, but I think there's something very specific that's being purified here. Think of Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah sees a vision of God high and lifted up. And when he sees this vision of, of God high and lifted up, Isaiah says this, he says, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And then in verse 6, it says that one of the angels, one of the seraphim, flew to him, and he takes a burning coal from, off of the, the, from out of the fire that's burning on the altar of heaven, and he touches Isaiah's lips. And the angel says this, he says, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then Isaiah says that he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for me? And then I said, Isaiah said, here I am, send me. And then God said to Isaiah, go and say to the people. And he gives him a message of God's mighty works and prophecy. See, here's the thing. At Pentecost, it is, the, the, it is our speech that is being purified. Our mouths and our tongues are being purified. Why? So that we might prophesy forth, speak forth the mighty works of God. What are the mighty works of God? The mighty works of God is everything that God has done that culminates in his plan of salvation in and through the works of Jesus Christ. See, this is the gospel that has the words of hope and life and joy. This is the gospel that brings words of peace and repentance and forgiveness. We're purified so that we may speak forth the gospel. Friends, what kind of words are, are you speaking today? Are you speaking forth words of hope and life and joy and that point to Christ? That's what we're purified to do. See, at Pentecost, the church is equipped with power, it's equipped with the purifying presence, and God equips us with his proclamation. God equips us with his proclamation. Verse 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Do you know that one of the main signs of being filled with the Spirit is that you speak? That's one of the main signs, specifically that you speak the things of God. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, Paul says, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord and giving thanks always. See, Spirit filling is exceedingly verbal. It's exceedingly verbal. See, and that's what we're seeing here at Pentecost, that they're being filled and empowered to speak the mighty works of God. And they're given this miraculous gift of tongues, the ability to speak in languages that are not their native language. Now, friends, the, the gifts of tongues that are given at Pentecost are known languages. Now, I understand there are, are several different interpretations of that, and depending on your background, you might interpret that differently. But as I look at Scripture and as I read the text, I don't see how it could be anything other than known languages. That doesn't mean that there's not things like prayer language, and we see that in other places in the Scripture. But at Pentecost, it's the gift of known languages that are, that are given to the disciples to speak. And in fact, that's incredibly important to the story. Because if you remember in Genesis chapter 11, it was originally known languages that were given as a curse and as a way of dividing humanity. 
Remember in Genesis chapter 11, we have the great Tower of Babel, that whole scene where humanity all spoke one language and in their hubris and in their pride, they thought, oh, let's build a temple to heaven and let's reach to heaven and God comes in and he says, yeah, I'm not having that. And he scatters them over the face of the earth and he confuses their language. See, the languages become a division becomes a curse. Did you know that Pentecost is the reversal of Babel? Pentecost is the reversal of Babel. God redeems, and he not only redeems, but he restores humanity, not by doing away with the differences of languages, but actually by redeeming the languages that he created in the first place. See, he reverses, he reverses Babel by taking that which was once a curse and meant as a source of division. He takes it and makes it a catalyst for the gospel and a source of unity. See, the diversity of languages now are something that's beautiful, that God uses to spread his gospel. Friends, there are many languages, but there's one message. There's one unifying message, and that message is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord who comes to seek and to save the lost, the Lord who brings good news to the poor, and the Lord who comes to set us free from our bondage of sin. Humanity once tried to build a temple to heaven. God says, no, 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 I'm going to build my temple, and here's how he does it. He baptizes us all into one body, into by one spirit and brings unity. Friends, we can't look at the world today and then think about Pentecost and see how God's purpose for his church is to be a unifying presence in a divisive world because at our identity is the spirit of unity. The spirit of unity. God builds his temple. In Ephesians chapter four, uh, Paul tells us to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is Father of all, who is over all, in all, and through all. Friends, Pentecost tells us our languages and our cultures don't divide us anymore. The church is the people called out from a divisive world, from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. And friends, the church is to be the people that the divisive, hopeless world can look to and say, hey, there is a different way. And we can say there's a different way because Jesus is king. The God that we worship is king of the universe. Friends, Pentecost is very, very verbal. And I've spoken a lot about our words and the message that we have because that's central to the idea of Pentecost. But you might be sitting here saying, you might be saying, but wait a minute, in a time like this, do our words really mean anything? Do our words mean anything in a time like this? And here's what I want to say, is that yes, they mean everything in a time like this. You know, there, there, there's an illustration. Uh, sometimes there's a, um, uh, a quote that has been falsely attributed to St. Francis that goes kind of like this. Um, Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. I can tell you St. Francis did not say that, and St. Francis would not have said that. See, to say something like, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words, as, uh, as I once heard. It's like saying, feed the homeless at all times, and if necessary, use food, <laughs> right? It, it doesn't really make sense. Because, see, sometimes we, we think that our words are meaningless and our deeds are all that matters. And deeds do matter, but, but friends, our words are central to the gospel. The gospel is passed through our words. Friends, God created all things by his word. Jesus, who is the word of God, 
is recreating all things. Words are absolutely essential to what God is doing in the world. And our words are necessary as long as they are the transforming words of the gospel. Now, Scripture does tell us we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And in a time like this, we definitely need to be very quick to listen. We don't want to go in guns blazing. That might not be the best phrase to use here, but, but the idea is, is we need to be quick to listen. But when we speak, which we must, they must be very deliberate and very intentionally words of the gospel that bring hope and speak peace and are words of truth that are dripping with love and with grace. And friends, sometimes we need to speak that gospel of hope even to ourselves because it's easy for us to look out at the world and find despair. And we need to remember that God is on the throne. And in speaking this gospel to ourselves, we need to take a hard look even at our own lives and in our own uh, corners of our own hearts and ask God to continually come in and clean out our hearts and transform our own lives. Friends, I know that things seem very overwhelming right now. And I know that seeing things seem very out of control. And it's okay to feel that way, but friends, we need to remember that these things, they don't overwhelm God. We need to understand that God is, is in control, that things are not out of control of God's sovereignty. We need to remember that Jesus is on the throne. We have his Holy Spirit as a confirmation of that truth. And so what we can do is we can pray. We can pray for thy kingdom to come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And friends, we need to keep our eyes fixed firmly on the throne of grace. In the name of Father, the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. For God's people throughout the world, for our bishops and our leaders, for this congregation, and all who serve Christ in his church. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For medical professionals, first responders, and for all in public service, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, for the sick and the suffering, for those who mourn, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the poor and oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who Remember and care for them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ, and persecutors of his disciples. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
for the blessings of this life and for your abundant mercy. We say prayers of thanks to you, Lord. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. Friends, together let us pray. 
Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and to all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Amen. Now, friends, receive this blessing. All our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes we set on the risen Christ. May Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Now, friends, let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.